Thanks for joining us today to listen to the message from Calvary Baptist Church in Lake Havasu. Today we kick off a series called The Gifts of Christmas, and today's message is based on Acts chapters 3 and 4. If you'd like to follow along with the Life Notes, you can download them now at calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here is Pastor Pete Bunnell. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for Jesus Christ, our living hope, that no matter what we are going through, we have this hope in Christ. Through every challenge, through every difficulty, we can turn to him and he's there for us and he's promising to redeem and to give us what we need to make it through with joy, to make it through with peace, to make it through drawing closer to you and knowing you more. Lord, as we turn to your word today, we want you to direct our minds and our hearts to understand you, to understand how you want us to live, and to make the changes that are needed in our lives because of your great word and the working of your Holy Spirit. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat, and while you do, you can grab a Bible or your Bible app and open to the book of Acts. Uh, If you're using the Bibles that are here in the rooms in the seat in front of you, that will be on page 1082. We're going to be in Acts chapter 3. And while you're turning there, I have just a real quick question. How many of you have got your Christmas list written out, your Christmas wish list written out? Let me see some hands. Yes, this has been my experience all weekend. I am incredibly alone because I have my list written. It is dispersed to my family. Um, I know what I want. I know what I'm hoping to get. Um, And uh, my wife and I are kind of bad, though, when it comes to this, because once we decide what our wish list is, we actually just end up getting it and starting to enjoy it right away. You know, we find it on sale, and we're like, okay, we've got it. Let's just start enjoying it. So I've been drinking cappuccinos from a new cappuccino maker for two weeks um, because we don't wait. Uh, Hopefully, you have more self-control than I have. Um, We actually do make our kids wait, though. They have to wait till Christmas to get their gifts. So, you know, typically that means that there's a closet that has all the gifts in it, and that closet is off limits, right? Don't go and rummage through the closet. You don't get to see what's in there. This year, the tree is already up. The packages are wrapped. So now they get to look at the packages and go, I wonder if the big package is for me, or I wonder what's inside that little package. They get that hope and that eager expectation for Christmas morning, hoping that they're going to get what they really want for Christmas. Now, imagine if we were able to make it appear as if there were no gifts for Christmas. What if we could um, just tell them, hey, go ahead, look through the closet. There's nothing in there for you. It doesn't matter. Or if there was no Christmas tree, or we'd never ask them, what do you want for Christmas? We didn't have any presents wrapped under the tree. If we could just make it seem like there's no gifts this year. You know what? they would not have very much hope for Christmas morning. And I think December would be a pretty depressing month because having that hope is what makes Christmas fun, you know? We live in a society where there's not a lot of hope. In fact, we live in a society where we're in a general state of dissatisfaction and disappointment. According to the Gallup poll, the last time that Americans generally felt satisfied with life was in the late 1990s. In the early 2000s, we started this downward trend of satisfaction with our lives. And in 2022, 90%, 90% of respondents said that they were dissatisfied with life. That's a lot, right? We have a nation that needs hope. We have neighbors that need hope. And we have the hope that they need. So today's message is titled, Giving the Gift of Hope. Giving the Gift of Hope. In today's passage, we're going to read about a man who was in a difficult situation who needed that gift of hope to be given to him. You see, he had been born handicapped, and he had to be carried around to get where he wanted to go. And his friends or his family would take him to the temple gate, 
right? They take him right to the entrance of the temple where everyone would be coming and going from worship and they would put him there and there is where he would beg and he would ask for money so he would have the, the things that he needed to live. And on the day that we're gonna read about, he actually comes across, he's, he's there at the temple gate and he comes across Peter and John, two of Jesus' disciples. So let me give you a little bit of Bible history here. Where we're at right now is the way that the Bible flow goes is Jesus has already been born. He's lived a perfect, sinless life. He's spent time with his disciples. He died on the cross. He rose again. He ascended into heaven. The Holy Spirit has come on his followers, and they are now serving him, and they're proclaiming the message through the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter and John are two of those disciples that were in this position of church leadership. And the church was growing. People were coming to know Jesus, and they were trusting in Jesus. And these two church leaders, Peter and John, are going into the temple, and they come across this beggar who was sitting there begging. Let's read about their interaction. We're in Acts chapter three, and I'm gonna start in verse three. We're going through uh, all of chapter three and most of chapter four. I will not have time to read all of it. So you guys have homework to read that later on, but let's look at verse three for now. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, and he raised him, and immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and he began to walk and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and they recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So we can see the first point of our lesson here is that we need to give the gift that you possess. Give the gift that you possess. Or if we were gonna say it in a different way, give the gift that you have received. You see, Peter and John did not have any money, right? They didn't have money, but what they did have was healing in the powerful name of Jesus. So that is the gift that they gave to the man. See, Peter and John had witnessed the life change that Jesus can bring, right? They had seen him heal people all the time. They had, been, they had experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Their lives had been changed, and, and they were able to serve Christ, and they were able to proclaim in the power of the Holy Spirit. They had seen thousands and thousands of people trust in the name of Christ and their lives changed. So they knew Jesus had power to change this man's lives and that's what they gave to him. Now you notice it was not what he asked for, was it? He didn't ask for that, but it is what he needed. It was what he needed and that is what they gave to him. His life was changed. He was healed. And this wasn't just a partial healing. He didn't become a man who limped or who hobbled along. He became a man who could leap and jump and praise God instantaneously. This was a complete and total healing. He went from being hopeless to being hope-filled in just a matter of moments because he met Jesus and Jesus healed him. So the people around him were amazed, right? It says that they were filled with wonder and amazement because they knew this man. They knew that he was usually sitting at the entrance begging, and today he was coming in leaping and praising God. When you encounter despair, you can find hope in Jesus. 
we're gonna encounter despair and difficulty in our life. It might be a personal issue that you're walking through. It might be something that the community as a whole has to walk through. It might be the spiritual bankruptcy that sin has caused in your life. Or maybe it's an illness that has got you down. Or maybe it's the loss of a loved one that we're all acquainted with. And we just feel the hopelessness. Find hope in Jesus. We can receive that hope that Jesus brings. He came to be your savior. That despair that you feel over the sin in your life or that despair at some point that you felt because sin was dominant in your life, Jesus came to save you from that. He came to reverse that in your life. He came to give you forgiveness and to change your life and to give you a hope for eternity with him. There is a hope for reversal of the destruction of sin. So when we talk about hope, biblically, what are we talking about? Are we talking about just like a fingers crossed kind of feeling like, oh, I, I hope this happens. This would be really great if it happens. That's not what biblical hope is. Biblical hope is that assurance that God will do what he said he will do. It is this sure expectation that we're waiting in confidence for God to fulfill his promises. He is reliable, and we can trust him. We can trust in Jesus to do what he said he would do. So once you've received this hope, you then have the ability to share this hope with others. Because in all areas of life, God provides hope. He promises to redeem and to restore the brokenness in our life. When we come across the destruction of death, because of Jesus, we look forward to resurrection. When we have the issues of broken relationships, we know that Christ can repair those. When we have problems with addiction and with sin, we know that Christ can give us recovery. All of the brokenness, all of the failures, God provides a way to redeem them. So we have words of hope that we can share with those in despair. I'd like to share with you a little story about a time when someone shared with me some words of hope. It was actually backstage here. It was January of this year, and it was a Saturday night service. And I was tasked with coming up here to greet everyone and, you know, smile and give everyone the announcements and all the stuff that goes along with um, being the, the welcome person. And uh, earlier in that day, though, I had gone out to eat, and I'd gone to a restaurant that you know, likes to tempt you with chips, the best chips in the world, and they just kept coming, and I just kept eating. And I ate, and I ate chips for a long time. And then I ate a gigantic burger on top of that. And then after that, I ate the full plate of fries that came along with that. And so by the time I was here, I felt sick. Like, I just had had way too much grease and way too much food. But on top of like the physicalness of that, there was also the spiritual reality that here I was totally defeated by a lack of self-control and let's just be honest, gluttony, right? And I had to come out on stage and be the happy, shiny Jesus person while I was feeling all of that yuckiness. And um, Chad was backstage with me and he's like, so how are you doing? Just kind of the, just the general, how are you doing? And I'm like, I'm not doing good, you know? And I just kind of laid it out. You know, I felt terrible um, and I didn't want to be out on stage talking about this. And then I said these words to him. I said, I said, I guess I'll never learn the self-control that I need. Do you hear the, how negative that is? I guess I'll never learn the self-control that I need. And I was expecting something negative back, something to affirm my negativity. But instead he said, oh, you'll learn just like that. He's like, oh, you'll learn. And those words were like a two by four hitting me on the back of the head because I was like, what? I could learn? I could learn to not have this lack of self-control. I could learn how to control my eating. And it was really life-changing. Now, Chad does not remember this conversation because all that he said was, oh, you'll learn. But for me, it was like, those are words of hope right there. Because it wasn't, it wasn't that 
Peter, you're such a great person, you're smart, you're gonna be able to learn. No, it's that if the Holy Spirit is working in your life, you can learn self-control because it is the fruit of the Spirit, right? It is something that the Spirit will produce in you. So he said, oh, you will learn. And that was message of hope for me. Um, you have words of hope. Everyone in this room has words of hope because you have this Bible, right? And this Bible is filled with words of hope. Let me share a couple of them with you. Romans 5, 5 says, and this hope will not lead to disappointment for we know how dearly God loves us. The hope that we have will not disappoint because God loves us so much that he gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to be our savior. The hope we have won't disappoint. Another one that I love is Psalm 42. The psalmist talks to himself in the midst of discouragement. He says, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God and I will praise him again, my savior and my God. You see, in the midst of despair, in the midst of discouragement, he, instead of listening to that discouragement and that negativity, he speaks to it and he says, I'm going to praise God again. I'm going to trust in God and I know that my hope is solid in him. There's so many verses like that in the Bible. Here's what we're going to do this week. Here's a little challenge, okay? This week on our social media feeds, on Facebook, Instagram, we're gonna put some verses out there that are verses of hope, okay? We've got five verses, we'll put one up each day. And I wanna encourage you guys to go online to get those verses and share them on your own feeds. Let's kind of inundate social media with some good news, some messages of hope. For those of you online, this is a great way for you to plug in with Calvary and just join us in dumping hope out for the world to see, because these are words of hope that others need to hear. Now, in the midst of this, let me encourage you not to share false hope, because we could share false hope, right? We could share things that put people's hope in the wrong place. I will share another story of epic failure on my part um, that kind of illustrates this. When I was first married, um, I was going to seminary out of state. And so um, I would be traveling a lot, staying in some hotel rooms sometimes. And I was talking to my wife on the phone. We've been married about a year. And I said, hey, um, I just want to let you know I got something for you that I'll bring for you when I get back um, home. And it was a true statement. But the full truth was that I didn't go shopping for this item. Um, I didn't go to a store specifically to get it for her. I had just found it in a hotel room. Um, and I'm pretty sure that at some point in our first year of marriage, she had said, oh, I would love to have this item. So I thought, perfect, she will like this. So I, bring, I come back from the trip, I bring it home, and I give her the wonderful gift of a cheap hotel shower cap. <laughs> I'm not kidding, I truly did this. And all the ladies are just like, I can't believe he did that. And all the guys are saying, rookie move, dude. That was a rookie move. And thankfully, I'm still married. So she's a gracious woman. Um, that, was, that was false hope, right? right? I, I said, hey, I've got something for you. And it's like, ooh, that's so special. No, it wasn't special at all. Um, False hope puts an expectation in something that's just not going to deliver. In Psalm 33, the psalmist writes that military strength is a false hope. You have to hope in God because God has ultimate power. We can be really guilty of sharing false hope. Let me tell you all, we need to not share a false hope that politics or a politician is going, are going to help us or change our lives. That is a false hope. We need to not share false hope that money or resources are going to be what we need because money and resources will ultimately fail us. Um, we cannot be holding out worldly wisdom or worldly philosophy as our hope for a changed life because we know for a life to truly change, we need Jesus Christ in it, working in it, to bring hope out of despair. 
So don't give false hope. So Peter and John, if we go back to our passage, they had healed this man in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus has he had healed him. And he was now leaping around and praising God. And everyone is amazed at this. And Peter turns this into a chance to invite others to have hope in Jesus. He's going to invite others to have hope in Jesus. So Peter starts to preach a sermon. We won't read the whole sermon, but let's just hit some of the highlights of what Peter shares. Chapter 3 of Acts, verse 14. Peter says, But you denied the holy and righteous one, and you asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus was given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. So he says, Jesus is the one that did this. And then he gives this invitation in verse 19. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you. Jesus. So, Peter points out to them that Jesus is the truth that they need. They need to turn to him. And they were primed for this message because they were in this state of wonder and amazement, right? I think Christmas brings us that opportunity, right? Christmas brings us to a point where in our society, there's a little bit of heightened wonder and amazement. There's a little bit of added interest in the things of God and in what is spiritual. And so we have this perfect opportunity to invite others to come and be a part of our worship experience and hear what Jesus has done. So this week we have invitation cards, right? They're out at the foyer, they're at the entrances. These invitation cards are the way that you can really easily share a little bit of hope this Christmas. We're going to have six services here in Lake Havasu City over Christmas Eve weekend. There's one in Parker. And this would be a great time to invite somebody to come and hear the Christmas message and the hope that Jesus can bring. Because an invitation goes a long ways to helping people know they're welcomed here. Do you know that um, the average person doesn't know they're welcomed into a church? It's true. They don't know they're welcomed. You know, if you come here every week, you know that everyone is welcomed at Calvary, right? You know that anybody could walk in the doors and come and be a part of our worship service and hear this good news. But they don't know that. And it's the invitation that says, you're welcome here. You're wanted here. We want you to be a part of this. That will go a long way to getting them into this facility and to hear this message. I'm going to share an invitation to the young adults in the room. If you're 18 to 28, we're going to do a Christmas party on December 12th. And we would love to have you come and be a part of that. Because we want to have a community of young adults here that loves Jesus, that's getting to know Jesus, and walking together. So there's information out at the foyer. There's stuff on our events page. But it's December 12th at 6.30. It's a Tuesday night. I hope that you guys will come and join us and have a good time. So there's another invitation for you. But let's share those invitations. Let's invite people to be a part of what's going on here at Calvary. So Peter is preaching this message but he doesn't get to finish his sermon because he's interrupted by the priests and by the temple guard and they come and they arrest Peter and John and they put them in jail. Because here is the facts. They did not want anyone else talking about Jesus. Just a few months ago, they had Jesus crucified. They did not want this name of Jesus going around. And then Jesus rose from the dead, and now the followers were walking around talking about it all the time. And they have this man in their temple jumping around praising God because Jesus healed him. 
They wanted to silence this. They didn't want this to keep going on. So they arrested Peter and John. Peter and John spent the night in jail. And in the next day, they get brought before the religious leaders. And in the midst of this conversation, Peter shares some hard truths with them. Look with me, if you will. I'm in uh, Acts 4 now. Acts 4, verse 11. Peter said this. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. That's pretty bold, right? It's like, hey, you rejected Jesus, but he is the only way that you can be saved. It's the only way that anyone can be saved. And the religious leaders hear this and they're like, Peter used to be a fisherman. He's not theologically trained. He's not an educated person. How could he be so bold as to proclaim that in front of us? He must have been with Jesus. They saw the change in Peter's life and like, he must have been with Jesus. And then you also have the man that was just healed, jumping around, praising God. They could not deny the fact that there was power and there was life change going on. And so they did the only thing that they could do. They told them to stop preaching in Jesus' name. Cut it out. Stop. No more. Don't do it. Look at Peter's response to him. Down in verse 19, Peter says this to the religious leaders. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. So that brings us to our final point. Don't let the opposition silence your hope in Jesus. Don't let the opposition silence your hope in Jesus. Just a few days after Jesus was risen from the dead, he was being opposed. They were, they were opposing it right after the resurrection. And it has continued for century after century. The world has been opposing the message of Jesus. So we shouldn't be surprised when it happens to us today. It's what should be expected. But just because it's expected doesn't mean we have to give in to it, right? When we're told not to talk about Jesus, we don't have to listen to that. I mean, just like Peter said, we need to tell what we know. We need to tell what we've experienced. I love Christmas time because it's not just a time of gifts, but it's also a time of lights, right? We put lights on our trees, we put lights on our houses, and it's just this reminder for me that there is light that can shine in the darkness. In John chapter 1, verse 4, it says, In him, in Jesus, was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light has shone in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. Darkness does not overcome light. So we have this great hope. We have this great light that we can share with the world around us, with our neighbors, with our friends, with our family. We shouldn't hide it. Remember what Matthew what Jesus said in Matthew 5, no one after lighting a lamp, what did they don't do? They don't hide it under a bushel basket, but rather they put it on a lampstand, right? They put it up high so it gives light to all in the house. So in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We have light. We have hope. Don't let the opposition cause you to hide that hope you have in Jesus. People need to hear what we know. People need to hear the life change that we've seen. 
So don't let fear or potential rejection stop you from sharing that hope. You know that Jesus has overcome despair in your own life. You have a life that's been transformed by Jesus. Someone else needs to hear about it. Someone else needs to see it. You are able to invite some people to give that gift of hope this Christmas season. So let's do that. Let's give the gift of hope to a world that really is in despair. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you so much for the hope that we have because of Jesus Christ. What amazing power that we can look around and we can hear of people whose lives are changed because of what Jesus has done. What amazing power that we can read of a man who in Jesus' name was made perfectly whole. His body was completely healed. How amazing that when we experience loss and we experience the pain of death and the pain of illness, that we can look at that and we can say, there's redemption, there's hope, there's resurrection. And all of this is because of Jesus. Because God the Son left his heavenly dwelling place and he became a human baby and he grew up, he lived a sinless life. And then he died on the cross for my sins and for the sins of the world. And then he rose again so that he could give us this life and he could give us this hope. So God, we are thankful for Christ, our living hope. And I ask that we would be very purposeful in sharing it this Christmas season. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Three encouragements to highlight from Pastor Pete's message. Give the gift that you possess. Invite others to have hope in Jesus. And don't let the opposition silence your hope in Jesus. If today's message spoke to you and you'd like to support the ministry of Calvary, you can do so by visiting our website, calvaryaz.com. The homepage has links to contact us, to give, listen to past sermons, and you can subscribe to receive our Word for the Day daily devotionals. Well, that'll do it for today. I hope you'll join us again next week. Bye-bye.